<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I don't have the best voice today, but we're going to get through this somehow. We, uh, we are at another beautiful Sunday, a little gloomy and rainy, but we're still going to get up and we're going to stand together and worship the Lord this morning as, as if it was a sunny day. All right, let's do it. Boy, it is good to be back. It is good to be back in, uh, in God's country, as they say. We, uh, our family took a little bit of a vacation this last week. We were down in Arkansas. And I got to say, it was pretty awesome getting into the car when it was 40 degrees outside and then getting out of the car in Arkansas when it was 80 degrees outside. I'm not exaggerating. I know, everybody. I've heard a few people tell me they're pretty jealous, and I should have brought some some of that heat back with us, but uh, we did not. But at the same time, I got out of the car this morning, and guys, there's green coming up out of that grass. There's, I saw green. <laughs> if you squint a little bit, there is some green. So better days are ahead for sure. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us. If you're a guest, we are so glad to have you, and uh, we're grateful for the time that you uh, give us. And if you're watching with us online too, thank you, whether that's in, uh, synchronously with us at this time or later on, it's great to have technology to be able to connect us via distance. Uh, a few announcements here. If you want to turn to the right side of your bulletin, I'm not going to read through everything, but there is a lot going on. There is a lot of text there. Uh, some of these are, are regular things, so I'll hit on a few of the, uh, the extra kind of 
things that maybe don't always occur every week. Uh, tonight from 5 to 7, there's this thing at the church called Faith, Fellowship, and Food. And all of those things will be present. So if you like food, if you like faith, if you like fellowship, if you like just one of those things, man, come, show up. They meet down in the basement. They are studying, I believe, the book of John. Is that right right now? And everybody brings a dish to share, potluck. So it's a great time to connect with uh, friends and to make new ones, too. So come on out to that. This Tuesday at 7.30 p.m., we're going to resume our adult Bible study in prayer curriculum on apologetics, which we started a couple of weeks ago. So we'll be getting back into the swing of that. There's still time to get in if you haven't. If you weren't there for the first one, you missed it. Guess what? You can listen to that online for free. Talk to me if you want to know how. I can connect you to that. Um, It's just a five-part series on apologetics, defending the Christian faith. And uh, that will be here at the church. It's a, a video curriculum. So basically, we just watch a video by this gentleman. He's an instructor. Dr. Francisco, he's a history professor, and uh, just a good primer on the basics of Christian apologetics, the defense of the faith. <clears throat> this Saturday at 9 a.m., youth group is going to be having an outreach event. We're going to be helping kind of partner with the city of Osakis uh, to plant flowers for their beautification. Uh, they do this every year, kind of when spring rolls around, so I think it's going to be starting around 9 a.m. We don't know details for sure, but Will and Grace will get that information to you as soon as it becomes available. Also, on your calendars, you're going to want to mark out the dates July 25th through the 28th. Vacation Bible School here at Elam Lutheran Church. This is one of the, the great events that we have throughout the year to involve the the community, it, it tends to draw a, a lot of kids, some of them unchurched, some of them who haven't heard the gospel before. So if you have people you're thinking about inviting, man, we really encourage you to start thinking about that early on. Heather Moore is the one who's heading all of this up, our, our planning and stuff for the year. And in the back, in the foyer, there is a, uh, was it a sign-up sheet, Heather? Um, a sign-up sheet, you can find out more information there. Um, and there's a little insert or a little blurb in the bulletin too, if you want to read through that. Uh, those are all the announcements I have. Linda Palo has something she would like to share. May 5th is National Day of Prayer. And um, we've always had something at Elam on National Day of Prayer, and we are again this year. Um, Billy Graham puts out this little booklet on National Day of Prayer on how to pray for your leaders and how to pray for people in the community. And we will be doing it at 7 o'clock on thir- this Thursday night, which is May 5th, if you would like to come, and we'll have some coffee and refreshments afterwards for fellowship. So please come and pray for our country, our leaders, and our community. And also, in the bulletin, it says May 15th, National Day of Prayer. But that is for prayer for BBS, as I understand the way it's written. Is that right, Heather? Yes. Okay. Not National Day of Prayer, the country one. Thank you. Oh, yeah, there's no CPR class tomorrow. We were talking about getting that together, but didn't have the numbers, I'm assuming, so we'll, there we go. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 30, just two verses here, verses 4 and 5. Sing praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Let's pause for a moment to reflect on those words as we prepare our hearts for worship today. Heavenly Father, weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. God, there are many reasons for us to weep in this broken world that we live in. There are many 
reasons and, and things that we see around us, God, where we realize things are not as they should be. Our own hearts are not as they should be. The world around us is not as it should be. There is brokenness and messiness everywhere, Father. But we thank you for the second half of this verse, God, that joy comes in the morning. And when that joy comes, it will be everlasting. And God, we live in light of that joy, that, that hope that we have And God, we live in light of Easter as we just celebrated so recently. Thank you that Easter is not a one-time event, but it is a season, God. And help us to see this world through the eyes of resurrection, through through the eyes of hope, through the eyes of, of Easter. God, I pray that you would bless our time together this morning. May all of the words that are spoken and the songs that are sung be honoring and glorifying to your name. And it's in that name that we pray right now. Amen. Please stand.
be seated. Good morning. Uh, I don't say the following for any accolades or anything, but Cheryl and I purchased a new house yesterday. And we're pretty excited because we're going from 3,300 square feet to 1,100 square feet. So. <laughs> but anyway, and I'm looking forward to that. But you know what? There is something I'm looking forward to more than a new house here. And that is a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21, 1 through 7 tells us about that. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear. From their eyes, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. You want to be a part of that? I hope so. For the old order of things has passed away. away. <clears throat> he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. I will be their God. And they will be my children. If you don't want that, I suggest that maybe you should want that. <laughs> I can't imagine how you wouldn't want that. But I, I thank God that passages like this are written so that we can look forward and know that this isn't it. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> I thank you for this passage and many others like it in your word that gives us hope and assurance that you will be coming to for those who believe in you have faith in you you will be coming to take us away from this which we think is good because it's all we've ever had but there is something so much better and i just thank you that you will be doing that father i pray for a blessing on this church I pray for a blessing on the missionaries of this church who are doing your work. We thank you for them. Help us to pray for them more often. I thank you for our pastor and his family and a new one coming. We thank you for that. We ask for protection for the new one. 
and a blessing on pastor, wife, and daughter at this point. Father, I just pray that you would uh, have your Holy Spirit help Pastor Luke with the sermon today and that the communion will be something that will be um, a blessing from us back to you as we receive it. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Lauren. Man, it's good to hear those words. It's good to hear of God's wonderful promises to us again and again and again because we forget them, don't we? But uh, we've heard now of, of the riches of God's goodness and what he promises to give us, and uh, now we have the opportunity to give back to him, not out of compulsion or compunction, but out of freedom. So with that in mind, I'll ask the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a gift-giving God. Thank you for the many gifts that you have bestowed upon each one here. Most of all, we thank you for the gift of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and the promise that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God, I pray that as we give back to you this morning, you would give us joyful and cheerful hearts, knowing, God, that these gifts that we speak of as having, we don't actually have, but we're just stewards of them. So use them to build your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. to invite you to stand as we sing um, hymn number we've switched it to 122 and uh, standing on the promises and um, we have so many promises given to us in the Bible what are we standing on are we standing on his promises and uh, we'll be hearing about his promises um, throughout our life let's find a, a stand and stand on it with his promises.
Amen. Amen. Woo. One other thing I should mention is that uh, we recently started a new men's Bible study that was originally going to meet on Monday nights, right? And now it's switched to Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. here at the church. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, talk to Rich Overson or Merlin Walter store, probably. Uh, Mondays, so that'll start, that'll be this Monday at 7 p.m. Ah, uh, that's what I meant. Wednesday at 7 p.m. <laughs> Our text for this morning's message comes from the book of Acts, and this is going to be kind of a two-part mini-series, I guess you could call it, Acts 9, verses 1 through 20. This is the conversion of the Apostle Paul, and we're still in the midst of Easter season, so we move into the book of Acts, which describes the development of the early church, and one of the very first uh, converts is the Apostle Paul, who becomes um, a great church planter and missionary and author of much of our New Testament. So let's hear a little bit about his story. I'll ask you to rise this morning for the reading of God's Word. This is Acts 9, verses 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. I pray that you would do your work upon each heart and each mind and each soul who is gathered. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood, and I looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, 
though as for the passing there, had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I didn't write that, in case there was any question. That's from Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. What road are you traveling? Where have you been and where are you going? We all have our journeys, our starting points, waypoints, and destinations. So what about you? What road are you on and where on that road do you find yourself this morning? Now, to the untrained eye, every road may look exactly the same, but after working as a civil engineer in highway design and construction for a number of years, I discovered that roads vary drastically in length, quality, and shape. Some are short and flat, some are long and hilly, some are straight, some are curvy, some stretch infinitely into the distance, some you can just barely see around the corner. Roads are made of all sorts of materials, too. Gravel, reclaimed bituminous, concrete and asphalt, just to name a few. Some are brand new and in mint condition, others have seen years of wear and tear and they're just kind of riddled with potholes. Some have a guardrail to keep you from going off the edge. Others, you can Google just dangerous roads, and you can see that some just hug mountainsides, and there's little between you and a thousand-foot drop off of a sheer cliff. Roads go through plains, plateaus, forests, over mountains and through valleys. They cross massive bodies of water and even tunnel under oceans. But, but every road has one thing in common. They all start somewhere and they all end somewhere. So what road do you find yourself traveling today? Where have you been and where are you going? Well, whatever it is, our text this morning, if it tells us one thing, it's that God will meet you where you are on whatever road you happen to be traveling. And when you encounter God, you will never be the same again. Saul was on a road too, the road to Damascus. You may know kind of how this story goes. Possibly you've heard it before. Saul was traveling to Damascus from Jerusalem, which would have been a journey about 140 miles. After receiving letters from the high priest in Jerusalem, giving him permission to imprison Christians that he found in the Jewish synagogues in Damascus. And why was he headed to Damascus? Well, the text tells us pretty plainly and clearly. It says he was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And, and this is no exaggeration. Not long before this, in Acts chapter 7, just a couple chapters back, Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was stoned to death outside of Jerusalem. And Saul was there for this. He stood by watching. In fact, if you read the text, it even says that he approved of their killing him. Elsewhere, we learn that Saul, he hauled Christians off to jail to their deaths. And what's, what's more is that he was actually proud of it. He thinks that he's doing a, a virtuous thing. He believes that killing Christians is a service to the Lord. He brags about it. Saul describes himself as a Pharisee among Pharisees, which is just another way of saying that he was like super hardcore when it came to the Jewish faith and dead set literally against any perceived threats to it, such as Christianity which early on, this is what Christianity was. It was perceived as just another sect of Judaism. Here's what Paul says in Galatians. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond 
many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Saul was a warrior for Judaism, and his number one enemy was Christianity. Christians. I love how Charles Spurgeon describes him. He says, a more furious bigot it is impossible to imagine. That was Saul, and this was the road he was traveling, literally on his way to arrest and imprison and kill Christians. In short, Saul was on his way to do some pretty serious sinning. But before he got there, something happened, didn't it? On the road to Damascus, Saul encountered Christ. A light from heaven flashed, knocking Saul to the ground. In most of the paintings you'll see of this, Saul is, is such as this one, Saul is riding a horse, which would, would have been very likely. We don't know for sure, but it, it makes sense given the, the length of the journey. And this light from heaven flashed, knocking him to the ground. And the voice from heaven says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now go up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So Paul got up, he opened his eyes, but he still couldn't see anything, right? He was blinded by this light. So his traveling companions took him by the arms, and, and they actually had to lead him into the city where he prayed and fasted for three days until God sends this guy by the name of Ananias, a disciple, to lay hands on him and to restore his sight. By the way, we'll talk more about Ananias next week. Immediately, Saul was, was baptized. I love that. There's, there's no question. There's no delay. It, immediately, Saul was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. And after spending several days with the disciples in Damascus, he headed out to preach about Jesus in the synagogues. And you may know the rest of the story. Saul goes on to plant churches all across Asia Minor, traveling as far as Rome, possibly beyond, in his fiery quest to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, right? This was kind of his title, the apostle to the Gentiles. He became God's chosen instrument for establishing the early church, authoring half of the books that we have in the New Testament today. The story, this story of, of Saul, this biography, is what we call a conversion story, a U-turn. You're going one day, and then something sends you off in another direction, you have a, a change of heart, a change of mind. And that's what happens when we encounter Jesus. We don't keep living the way we did before, but instead, what does God do? He, he transforms us, guiding us off of the road that, that we had been traveling on and sending us off on a completely new road, right? We're, we're going one way, and then we're going somewhere else. Really, this whole concept of conversion is nothing short of, of miraculous. The results of conversion are astounding. By any measure, Saul was a really, really bad dude. I mean, like, I've done some stuff. I'm not going to tell you what stuff. I've done some stuff, though. But murdering Christians in the name of God and then bragging about it like it was the best thing I had ever done, that is not on my list. Previous work experience, studied the Torah, learned under Gamaliel, lived a holy life, and murdered Christians. If there was ever an enemy of the gospel, it was St. Paul. But when God got hold of him, right, his entire life changed. His world was turned upside down. He saw the light and the error of his ways was revealed. Everything he thought was right turned out to be wrong. The good he thought he was doing turned out to actually be bad. The straight road he thought he'd taken turned out to be crooked. As Peter L. Haynes notes, when someone is headed in the wrong direction, it may take a blinding light to expose his own blindness. You see, like Saul, we too are born spiritually blind. 
running down our own roads to Damascus at a breakneck pace, heading in the direction we think is right, certain that our motivations are pure, that our presuppositions are the right ones, that we are good, everyone else is bad, we are right, everyone else is wrong. So often we are the ones Jesus spoke about in Mark 4, 12. The ones who are ever seeing but never perceiving. The reality is that our spiritual compasses are so broken that north is south, east is west. In other words, they're unreliable guides. We don't know our right hand from our left would be another biblical way of saying this. Have you ever been dead certain you were right about something and then come to find out later you were wrong, like you've been doing it a really long time and then find out that, man, this is not actually the way that it's supposed to work? It's an incredibly humbling thing. Luckily, as my wife will attest, God has blessed me with the spiritual gift of never being wrong. So it doesn't really apply to me. Um, Maybe others of you can identify In all seriousness, though, just a cursory glance at history is enough to show that human beings are terrible judges of right and wrong. For hundreds of years, Bible-believing Christians in America supported the the practice of slavery, treating another human being made in the image of God like property. And you know what? They even used Scripture to support it pointing to passages like Ephesians 5, 5, 5, which reads, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. They would use verses like that to justify and and rationalize kidnapping, beating, and raping African Americans, the consequences of which are still very present today. Many other examples come to mind. Crusades, the Thirty Years' War, the Inquisition. And where did all of these start? started in the hearts and the minds of sinful human beings. You see, we're all ancestors of Adam. That means the same blood courses through our veins as well. The good news, though, is that God, in His infinite mercy and wisdom, does, performs, in a sense, a spiritual blood transfusion because God sent a second Adam to put right what the first Adam got wrong. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, came to save the world from sin through His life, death, and resurrection for you. And what's more, as Saul tells us elsewhere, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, God's miraculous conversion of sinners never stops. It's never just this once and done kind of thing. He is always looking to turn us from our own crooked ways to His ways. Like Saul, we too are natural born enemies of God. But what we learn here from Paul's story is that God doesn't treat us like enemies. He treats us like friends. One of my favorite parts of this text is, you've probably noticed this, who is it that takes all of the initiative in Saul's conversion? Who takes the initiative? Jesus, God, all of it. He doesn't wait for Saul to get his act together before he he meets him on the road to Damascus and converts him. He doesn't wait for Saul to see the error of his ways and to come to his senses. Instead, Jesus just shows up and blinds him with a light right when Saul is at his worst, literally when he was on the road to kill Christians. Saul was not expecting Jesus to show up in the midst of his broken, wayward life. Jesus showed up anyway, and as a result, he brought him to repentance. He brought Saul to faith. And you know what? Jesus doesn't wait for us to get our acts together before He comes to us either. I think a lot of times we kind of feel like 
we have to clean up our lives sufficiently in order for God to first love us? Like, we need to do some serious spiritual house cleaning if we want to qualify for God's love, right? We think that His love, like all other loves we experience here on earth, is dependent on some degree, some small degree even, on our own moral performance, right? You hear this. People won't say it that way. We won't articulate it in those terms. But you hear this attitude when people say things like, I don't go to church because I'm not good enough. Or God would never want anything to do with someone like me. You see, our default operating system as human beings tells us that love corresponds to the worthiness of the recipient. I'll say that again. Love, this is our, our default way of thinking, love corresponds to the worthiness of the recipient, the worthiness of the beloved. In other words, we believe, and we can't get this out of our brains, that our own lovability must factor into the equation. But what today's story teaches us is the beautiful gospel truth that we are unconditionally loved despite how unlovable we are and that this love springs from God's fatherly heart rather than our own performance. Jesus shows up when we're at our worst, not when we're at our best. He forgives us, declaring, as Saul says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Through His death and resurrection, He conquers the power of sin and the devil. He frees us from the fear of never being enough, of never measuring up. For those who believe in Jesus, God looks on us with Christ-tinted lenses Think of it like that. He gives us, he looks at us with Christ tinted lenses and he says, In you I am well pleased. Not because of how good you are, not because of your Sunday school attendance record or how much you give to the offering, not because of how faithful you are to your Bible reading plan, not because of how many hours a week you spend on your knees in prayer. Not because of how good a father, mother, son, or daughter you are. Not because of how many years you've managed to stay on the wagon. Not because of how smart you are, how good of an athlete you are, or how many friends you have. Not because of how many people like your latest posts on Instagram or Snapchat. Not because of how many hours you spend volunteering for your community. That's not why God is well pleased with you. God is pleased with you for one reason and one reason only. Jesus. Because God is well pleased with Jesus, He is well pleased with you too, brother and sister in Christ. But God doesn't stop there, does He? As one of my seminary professors used to say, it's true that God loves us just the way we are, but He also loves us too much to let us stay that way, right? Conversion means change. It means a U-turn. It means an about face. It means God gets hold of your heart and He transforms it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as the Apostle Paul found out on the road to Damascus, man, this is an incredibly painful process. Because repentance always means dying to ourselves. C.S. Lewis put it this way in Mere Christianity. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what He is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you are not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of, 
throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. When we encounter the risen Christ, we can never be the same again. And that's not a command, by the way, like, you've encountered Jesus, now go out and don't be changed, or go out and never be the same again. That's not a command. It's a promise, a promise that when Jesus meets us along the road and He knocks us down off of our high horses with His brilliant light, it changes us. God kills us in order to make us alive. He brings us to the end of ourselves, to the point where we, like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, can do nothing other than fall to our knees and cry out, Lord, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's then that God begins His work of conversion. And when God gets hold of people, some pretty amazing things happened. As Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon uh, says this, of the Apostle Paul. God transforms the foe into a friend. He makes the man who was a warrior against the gospel a soldier for it. God does the same thing with us. As Saul himself tells us in Romans 5.10, we were God's enemies, but He made us His friends through the death of His Son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life. So back to our original question this morning. What, what road are you traveling? Where have you been? And where are you going? We'd all probably answer those questions differently. But whatever response you give, the truth is that God wants to meet you where you are. There's nothing he can't work with. There's no road that's like outside of his jurisdiction. God comes to us where we're at. And his work of conversion never stops. He meets our wandering hearts in the midst of their brokenness to heal them, restore them, and to put us back on the right road. Which is really just another way of saying he leads us back to himself. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, sometimes we think of conversion in the sense of a non-believer becoming a believer. And this is certainly true. Conversion, though, takes many different forms. And it's not just for non-believers. That may sound strange, but hear me out. To say that I, as a believer, have no need of conversion today that I have no need of having my heart changed and transformed is really just another way of saying I am without sin. The road I'm on is fine. I don't need Jesus to change me. In a very real sense, then, we are all in need of daily conversion. There's a reason that Martin Luther's first of his theses was the entire life of a Christian is a life of repentance. Maybe you, like the Apostle Paul, find yourself encountering Christ for the first time this morning. Or maybe you're encountering Him for the thousandth time or the ten thousandth time. But in either case, God is doing the exact same thing that He's always done. He's restoring messy, messed up people in a messy, messed up world to a right relationship with Him through the shed blood of His Son. Whenever we call upon His name, His promise is that He will always heal, restore, and forgive. Why? Because God's grace knows no limits. God's grace knows no limits. And He wants to do all of that for you this morning, too. So as we wrap up our time together today, Stan, you can go to the last slide. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, I want to leave you with the lyrics of this old, well-known 
him. My hope is that these words would become our daily confession and prayer as well. We've got them on the screen, so I invite you to just please say these with me now in closing. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we can never thank you enough for all that you did in sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. He took on flesh. He opened wide His arms for us on the cross, putting an end to death by rising to new life. And God, we live in light of that Easter hope this morning. God, our hearts are so prone to wander. And we thank you that, that you are a God who seeks out the lost, who puts us back on your shoulders, who calls us to repentance and, and brings us back into the fold. Thank you, God, that your grace and forgiveness know no limits. And Heavenly Father, we have a number of requests we want to lift up to you today. God, we think of the Easter season, God, and we thank you that it is not a single day, but it is an entire season in this church calendar. I pray that the hope of, of Easter, the good news of the resurrection, would bring salvation to our sin-weary world. Heavenly Father, there's so much darkness and so much pain and so much suffering. I pray that people would find answers in Jesus and that you would give us a boldness in speaking of you. God, we pray for those injured in the recent subway shooting in Brooklyn. I pray that you would be present to bring healing, to restore. God, minimize any further suffering that may be happening. Be present with the victims and their families as well. God, we pray for those who have recently lost loved ones. We ask that you would be especially near to them, that you would surround them with your comfort and your peace that surpasses all understanding, God, that they would know that even as we mourn and grieve for those who believe in you, we do not do so as those who have no hope, but we have a hope in Jesus Christ and the hope and promise, a sure promise of eternal life. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin to transition our service into a time when we'll come together to have communion, uh, we're going to sing a hymn here, Just As I Am, number 306. And as we do that, if you're planning on taking off, if you need to get out of here, now would be a good time to, to make your exit. Um, otherwise, we encourage you to, to join us at the Lord's table this morning. So hymn number 306, Just As I Am. Please rise.
You may be seated. If you have your bulletins now, I encourage you to turn just to the back of them. And I want to I wanna just do a little bit of review here of the Lord's Supper. And I think it's a very easy thing for us to get in the habit of doing things. This is our nature as human beings that we just kind of get used to them. And we don't ask, well, what's the, what's the purpose? Why do we do this? And so we want to just, I want to review this very briefly with you today. Just some common questions some of us may have as we come to the Lord's table. First of all, what is communion? Well, Jesus himself answers this question at the Last Supper, speaking these words to his disciples. This is my body given for you, and this cup is the new covenant in my blood. In communion, what do we do? Well, we celebrate God's good gifts, forgiveness, closer relationship with Christ, and strengthening in faith, hope, and love. All of these are promised to us in the Holy Scripture. Well, what about this question? Can I take communion? Am I someone who can receive communion today. Well, here at Elam, we don't practice closed communion, so you don't have to be a member of our church to participate. Communion is intended for those who recognize their own sinfulness and believe in Jesus as their Savior. It's our practice to serve those who have been properly instructed. Unfortunately, Scripture does not give us a specific age at which we can take communion. It would be very nice if God was more explicit on these things. And so we use wisdom and we use good practice. And we need to be old enough to examine ourselves. And generally, confirmation age is the time when, when we do that. Uh, but we still encourage children to, to be here and to be a part of it, to receive a blessing. Here's another big question that I, I don't think is uncommon. What if I feel unworthy? What if I feel like I'm not worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper today? Well, Scripture does give us a warning against eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. And this is why, as we get into the service, we will pause for individual examination and confession. However, a sense of unworthiness is actually proper and good if it, re if it causes us to reach out for the worthiness of Christ. So if you recognize your own need for forgiveness, you are welcome at the table. And how this works is we ask you to please remain seated. The elders will come forward. They will distribute the elements to you row by row. And as you pass the plate to your neighbor, well, we ask that you say to them exactly what the elders are going to say to you. This is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. It's a wonderful way when we can encourage one another through very flesh and blood means. And your neighbors really need to hear this. And then finally, once you have been served, we'll all hold on to the elements, and then we'll just eat and drink together at the end. So with that in mind, let us listen to the story of our Lord's suffering and death for us as given in the Holy Scriptures. When they, placed, they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head 
and gave up his spirit. Let us now hear the gracious invitation of our Lord given to us in the Holy Scriptures. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then finally, from 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And having heard this wonderful promise from God about how whenever we confess, he is faithful to forgive, let's pause for a brief moment of private reflection and confession before the Lord this morning. I'll ask you to please rise now as we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Scriptures tell us the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me. The scriptures also tell us then he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. At this time I'll ask the elders to come forward, and you will be served by the Lord.
is the body of Jesus Christ given for you. This is the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ has now given you his holy body and blood through which he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto everlasting life. Amen. The scriptures tell us, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you join with me now in praying the prayer that our Lord taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
Good. 